Hello everyone, my name is Richard Hodder. I'm from Pelling Consulting, Cybersecurity and Privacy Specialist for the Yachting and Maritime Sector. Uh, thank you for join us, joining us on this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, I would just like to do a bit of brief housekeeping for the webinar itself. On your screen on the right hand side you should see some controls. You'll be able to ask questions, um, just pop that into the chat there. If you have any problems with uh, sound or it freezes up, uh, just give it a chance. Uh, it will continue. We are recording this as well, so you can catch it later on as well. The webinar today is just how easy is it to hack a yacht. Uh, with me, I have Campbell Murray, um, who has uh, much, much experience in the uh, cybersecurity world, as uh, experience in the marine sector as well. Campbell, welcome to this webinar. I'm looking forward to chatting to you today. You know, just Thank you very much. Introduction. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Well, by a uh, brief introduction, yeah, um, I've got about 24 years experience in cybersecurity, um, predominantly running my own consultancy businesses on a, on a global scale. We've uh, specialized in automotive, maritime, aerospace, IoT, hardware hacking, as well as your more traditional kind of cybersecurity consultancy, uh, as well as training. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Okay, uh, great. Um, so, yeah, Pelican Consulting, we, uh, we work closely with uh, the yachts and maritime sector uh, to provide a, a full cybersecurity solution, uh, working closely with our partners as well to, uh, to offer that, that service from physical security through the virtual world and um, you know, through into the training as well. Um, so one of the, the reasons brought you on, Campbell, is um, obviously your experience in the yachting world and uh, the, this, this newspaper article, actually, I'm not sure whether it's fake news or not, but um, some people might be familiar with this from the, uh, the London Super Yacht Conference in uh, 2017, I think it was. Um, right. where you were... Uh, Allegedly able to, uh, to to get into a yacht nearby. What what was what's what's the <laughs> background of this uh, particular uh, story? Yeah, there's quite a story around this article. Um, it should never have been in the newspapers. I was invited to present on the cybersecurity topics and be a panelist at the Super Yacht Conference in London. I, I was there this year as well, um, oh. doing a similar uh, similar subject. However, it was a closed conference, and those familiar with it should know that there should be no journalists in there. Uh, the article actually gives the impression that I was talking to a journalist. I wasn't. Uh, I actually got in quite a bit of trouble with my employers at the time because uh, this, this hadn't been authorised to speak. It was originally posted in the Guardian newspaper. Uh, the content there actually comes directly out of a real-world example of an assessment that we did on a super yacht. Uh, we were given, uh, it was a yacht that was being refitted uh, back in uh, late 2016, I think, is when we actually did this particular assessment. And my colleague and I landed, uh, I'm, I'm reticent to give any sort of details around it, but we landed uh, in the region where the yacht was being refitted. And we'd been tasked with assessing the engineering principles and the, the security design around the new networks and the new systems uh, on, on the yacht. We landed the night before, uh, got in the hire car and thought, well, we've got to be there in the morning. Let's go find this boat before we go to the hotel and have a beer. So uh, we've got our you know, rubbishy little um, run-of-the-mill uh, hire car at the airport, drove down to the docks, and it was just there. I mean, it was enormous, 100-something metres, um, this boat. Couldn't miss it. It was in dry dock at the time, and we could park pretty close. And we thought, you know what, let's have a look. So we got the laptops out the back. And within 30 minutes, actually took us 25 minutes to get onto the Wi-Fi because of the distance. We were maybe 50, 60 meters away. Uh, and just with a regular laptop, you know, we weren't using any specialist equipment, although we did bring it with us. We had uh, high gain antennas and various other RF kit in our bags, but we just thought, let's have a quick look. We know we're going to be in the morning. What are we dealing with? Uh, 25 minutes to crack into the crew Wi-Fi network. And from there, we had three rain of the boat. Of the boat. Uh, whilst there was owner, crew and guest Wi-Fi networks, we found that they were completely flat. There was no segregation between them. The fact that they put up three different SSIDs was purely to give the impression that there were three different networks there. It was all just connected to the same set of routers. Uh, we could get on the CCTV, uh, all default usernames and passwords for all the CCTV controllers, the entertainment systems, uh, all the in-vehicle entertainment, pretty standard stuff. Uh, all the engine control units all in the same flat network. Uh, while they were 
separated out into different network ranges, there was no real firewalling or separation of traffic between anything in there. And we just use this um, at the conference as, a, as an example of like, this is really the current state. This is the boat that's just been refitted. And the people who designed this network, they designed it to give the impression of security where really none exists. And that was the message behind uh, the conference um, spiel, really, to say, ask the right questions of your suppliers was, uh, was the bottom line. However, journalists had um, engineered their way in. So far, there were no journalists allowed. This particular individual had managed to convince the organisers that they did work in the yachting, you know, they bought a ticket, they sat at the back of the room and then they wrote this article. We're just going to show what the kind of threat actors for this industry are. Because uh, if a journalist is just trying to get in under false pretenses, uh, just to write articles about, eh, super yachts and, you know, um, just because they're expensive doesn't mean they're any good. I'm going to fail to kind of see the point of the article, to be honest. Uh, and so it's just like social engineering then really what, you, what we have here with this newspaper article because it looks like you know you read through it um it's still up online and it does look like the interview is with yourself and with the, the pictures obviously it's not london but um you know you'd, you'd suggest maybe that uh, it was all planned and uh, the, the journalist had uh, access to you for this that's right yeah and that's actually for my, my employers at the time um I got in quite a lot of trouble because it wasn't an authorised interview um, and normally for that corporation uh, any media appearances of which I did hundreds for them during that time they're, they're logged they're, you, you get the, the briefing from the PR team and the media team saying don't talk about this talk about this so, and because this was unauthorised they actually thought that I'd sat down and been interviewed face to face by this journalist and, and I simply haven't um, wow. so we raised that I mean uh, it, we did go to the conference organisers, apologised and said, you know, it, it should not have been there, slipped through the net, managed to, as you say, socially engineer their way into the conference to uh, to dig dirt, effectively. Um, so if, that's, so uh, if, if this can happen at a conference, I mean, uh, the same kind of uh, thing can happen, somebody approaching a yacht to, to get on, on board, uh, yeah. social engineering, get a good story behind them and work their way into that yacht um, and get close to systems, potentially. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to just talk about, um, our friends at Inmarsat, every year they release the Superyacht Connectivity Report where they talk to people in the, uh, in the yachting industry and they do this survey every year to find out what the, the general lay of the land is with uh, cyber security on board, how people are aware of cyber security and, and what they're not aware of and you know we've got some of these uh, statistics here uh, I'd just like to say uh, thanks to Inmarsat for for doing this um, and um, yeah these, these are quite some interesting statistics I've just you know taken the first few there um, to talk about really and um, you know it's quite a low number there 7.5 percent of respondents say that no one oversees cyber security on board is that if you tie that in with the uh, the next statistic more than 80 percent of respondents show a lack of awareness those two figures are a little bit extreme in, in the opposites aren't they I would say. Yeah. yeah it really does tell a story um and whilst every minute Cybersecurity is everybody's problem. It's not IT's issue. It's not the engineer's issue. It's it is everybody's responsibility. Everybody in any system is a cybersecurity personnel. Uh, what this says to me is almost that for optics, for giving the impression of security, maybe the the ETO or someone else in crew has been given the role of cybersecurity. So right, Keith, Sarah, whoever, you're now responsible for cybersecurity. But do they really know what they're doing? I mean, what's the, what's the level of awareness they've got? We've got only 7.5% of the respondents saying that, no, we don't have anybody responsible for cybersecurity, but 80% show general lack of awareness. I mean, somebody's been given the job title, but how are they going to be effective uh, in that role? Uh, if only 17% know the difference between antivirus and endpoint security, uh, that's quite alarming, really. Those are quite alarming statistics, to be honest. Sure. So um, a bit of um, ambiguity in... in the responses I would say that, uh, that are being given. That, uh, that report is available online and it's, it's worth a read to anyone uh, in the yachting industry that's um, concerned about cyber security. It's great that Inmarsat do that every year. 
Um, so yeah, looking looking ahead and um, access to your systems, IT versus OT, information technology versus operational technology, two different things. How easy is it? Can we sit next to a yacht and access the Wi-Fi? Sounds like we can, based on the demonstration uh, you did. Which systems are there? There's so many inroads into a yacht nowadays that uh, from the internet connections to the, uh, the AV equipment to the control systems on board. Is any specialist knowledge required for this? Depends on your attack patterns. So in our industry as um, offensive consultants where we actually simulate attackers, we'll always look uh, passively first of all to find out what are, the, what are the available opportunities to us. Now things like Wi-Fi um, hacking really don't require any specialist knowledge. You can download uh, software onto your laptop, which will do everything automatically for you. You, you just press go. Pick the Wi-Fi you want it to try and hack, and off it goes. No specialist knowledge required. However, uh, looking at a yacht and the system we've got, um, we've got uh, long-range Bluetooth, various radio frequency things uh, working on there, which do require, and I'm looking for it now, just happen to have, you know, um, things or devices such as this, which are uh, a little bit more advanced, and will uh, allow me to assess, analyze, and attack a variety of radio frequencies, including Bluetooth. Again, very small, uh, not very expensive either, but it require considerably more, more knowledge. When we're looking at uh, onboard systems, uh, the, the convergence between is worth at this point of defining what IT is and what OT is. Um, IT is user space. That's going to be your, your user space, iPads, laptops, um, email systems and Wi-Fi Bluetooth connectivity, for example. Operational technology is exactly the same technology. It's still Windows or Linux operating systems. It's still TCP IP networking. It's, it's exactly the same, but it's been applied differently and requires more familiarity with it to understand what it's doing, how it can be attacked. Um, so there, there are stages there, you know, from really no knowledge, just an awareness that Wi-Fi can be attacked right up to things like using JTAG emulators and connectors into ECUs to reverse engineer firmware of uh, things like engine ECUs, um, bound thrusters, whatever's electronically controlled, which does require pretty specialist knowledge and specialist equipment. So from an attack tree and attack uh, formation, as consultants, or as any attacker would, we look for what are our opportunities, and we'll rate them on ease. And there is no attacker out there in the world who's not gonna take the easiest route. So part of the process of consultancy, part of the process of hardening uh, your attack surface and minimizing your threat surface on any system is to make those simpler things as difficult to access as possible. In terms of Wi-Fi, that if you've got guest Wi-Fi, make sure it's segregated and have it tested and verified that someone who can get on easily with a, with a, a published password around the ship. Uh, can't then get into other areas of the network and make sure that's tested, for example. If it's uh, owner or crew Wi-Fi, there are various other mechanisms. The password for WPA is not the only mechanism. You can use Radius servers in the background as well for Active Directory or um, Kerberos authentication, for example. You can even put them into VLAN segregation. There are, there are stacks and stacks and stacks of layers of protection that can be added relatively quickly and relatively cheaply um, but I always caveat that we should never go too far because we sure. have to balance usability with security and if we're making it really hard to get on on Wi-Fi you've got to question what's the point of having the Wi-Fi. Same with Bluetooth. Sorry, fair on, to say, sorry yes fair to say some basic um, uh, procedures uh, such as segregating the network uh, obviously it requires a little bit of specialist knowledge to do that, but that would be one of the basic things to do. Segregate the network, put a firewall in there, uh, keep the AV system separate from the owner network, from the crew network, uh, ensure that the, the critical systems for running the boat are not um, connected to those, those somehow. Um, you know, and I think a lot of uh, attacks can, well, yeah, cyber attacks could be stopped with a, a couple of these simple procedures. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get too complicated. It is some basic knowledge. I know from experience some of the installs on uh, on vessels, not only yachts but um, commercial vessels as well. And yeah, by the way, this this applies to you know not just yachts, commercial vessels, also businesses, homes, 
wherever you've got any kind of connectivity and wherever there's information flowing through, um, that some of these installations are rushed, poorly done. So naturally it leaves some, some gaps in the network where people can, uh, can jump in there. If they can get on one device on your, your network, whether it's the, the Wi-Fi or a Wi-Fi enabled device, IoT device, um, potentially they can get in the rest of the network if it's, if it's not firewalled properly and you don't have those um, mechanisms in place to, to segregate the network properly. Yeah, that's correct. And so the, the amount of effort to put people off doesn't have to be that hard, um, doesn't have to be that high. Attackers will always go for the low hanging fruit. If you say you have a website online, if it resists the top 10 most common basic attacks, an attacker will probably move on, go and find something that is hackable. Uh, same with any system. Unless, of course, we've got the, the new slide is, you know, who? Um, who are the threat actors? And they fall into a number of different categories. And if you find persistent, and dedicated uh, attackers trying to get onto your systems, they will do it eventually. Uh, there's no security is not a destination. Uh, you don't suddenly arrive at being completely secure. It's a process, and that's something very, very important to bear in mind. There's definitely not one thing that uh, that can be done. Like you say, there's a, there's a whole raft of things from the human to the the technological as well. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what is to gain in this case. So if your systems are, are tied down and you know, you're not an easy target for a for a hacker. What are the other motivations for that? And if attack an attacker or hacker really wants to um, get into a system or knows what he's after, what what is it uh, in your experience that uh, they're after? Is it one thing, or is it financial? Yeah. Is it espionage? Reputation damage? It's all of these things. Um, you know, uh, threat actors fall into fairly loose groups. So we've got um, foreign intelligence agencies. They're the ones you really got to worry about because um, they have unlimited resources. Power, I Sorry? They've got the power behind them to, to do yeah. a lot of damage and um, take the time to uh, scope out a target. That's right, yeah. They, they have the knowledge, they have the expertise, and they have the resources. Uh, you have cyber criminals, of course, uh, organized crime. Falls into two basic categories. You get loose groups of cyber criminals like a Lulsec and Lizard Squad, who have no structure. They're just a, a group of uh, a loose collective, if you want, uh, but are trying to achieve various things. You have highly organised crime, uh, where you have CEOs and management structures of people down to an army of uh, of a hackers with a variety of talents and specialities. Uh, you can really there, there's no one particular shape that falls into anything. Um, and it really depends on what the uh, the owners and, and the crew are worried about when it comes to ships. So uh, what you've got on there, damage of reputation, you know, that's, uh, you can't put a price on reputation. It's an intangible asset, uh, is how we describe it. Um, the reputation of the, of the ship and of the crew is obviously at stake uh, at all times. Uh, commercial espionage, that's probably one of the most important ones for the ship sector, I would say. Um, owners and guests tend to be very high profile people. Um, plenty of people out there, uh, rival organisations, rival uh, corporates who would want to know where you're going, who are you talking to, uh, what is your business, um, you know, what products are you developing, all of that is valuable. It affects stock market shares on a global scale and having that kind of information would be hugely valuable um, to anybody. Um, obviously inadvertent um, damage is, we have to expect that. One of, the, one of the messages I like to, to convey to all organisations is that it's okay to fail. Uh, and this is a bit of a, a refreshing concept, I think, for people. When we're looking at crew and we're, and we're looking at any kind of organisation and we think of a ship as, a, as an office building, uh, it's effectively the same thing. It's all right for you to receive a phishing email and accidentally maybe click on it. Just don't hide it. You might think, oh, oh, I should not have done that, but don't hide yeah. it. Okay, I think people have done it. We've all probably been there, clicked on that, clicked on yeah. a link of uh, a spreadsheet we shouldn't have done. And sometimes these things are crafted so well. I know in, in my experience, making travel plans one day, uh, a few, about half an hour later after making the travel bookings through, through work, I got a travel itinerary email. Okay, makes sense, I've been making travel bookings. Don't know how uh, it came about, but uh, yeah, I clicked on the uh, this, this spreadsheet, a lot of Russian characters in there, 
luckily it didn't do any damage, but uh, because of the macros that keep the uh, script inside from running it, it by default in Microsoft Office. But uh, yeah, you know, busy afternoon, easy to fall into that trap and click the link, especially if you're you know, a little bit um, uh, overworked or, or busy, definitely. Yeah, that can be it. You just be feeling tired one day, not fully up to form. But as I say, it's okay. Um, obviously, we try and avoid that. We train people to avoid that kind of behavior and spot that behavior as much as possible. But people are people. We're not 100% foolproof. But as long as that's admitted to, and uh, there should be no repercussions uh, for anybody for falling into a trap like that, as long as it's alerted yep. and it's handled properly, uh, so this uh, stigma around, oh, well, you know, that the, they're obviously foolish, they click that. No, it's, it, everybody can be tricked. And if we actually look historically at the last 10 years for uh, major breaches, uh, not around shipping in particular, but around any organisations, you'll find mm -hmm. the majority, 80% of them, have involved elements of social engineering or human error. And even uh, famously back, I think, 2014, the HB Gary corporate, uh, who made a, a bit of a foolish claim that they were going to uh, reveal all the members of a particularly notorious hacking group of that era at the DEF CON conference in Vegas. Uh, 48 hours later, they had been completely taken down uh, and out of business from a multi-million dollar corporation into nothing because of a phone call. And it was a, a, a young lady, but we know we think her name is Alice, we're not really sure, phoned up the server ops said, oh, I'm newly appointed, I work with a CEO, and uh, he needs to remote in to get some information, but I'm new and I haven't got the username and password for the service, and they gave it to him. And that was it, from then on, all of their emails published online, all of their assets stripped within 48 hours. Classic social engineering example, yeah. which uh, we can all fall for, because we want to help people at the end of the day, and uh, you know, that's, that's human nature. If you, you can talk and they were about your subject, yeah. Mm. Go ahead, sorry, Campbell. I thought uh, HP Gary were a high-profile cybersecurity company as well, and you know you know for it. So I say it's okay to fail as long as you admit to it, and um, yeah. you're only going to admit to it if there are no serious repercussions for it. You know, and that's yeah. a culture that needs to be instilled. But yeah, I'm still looking at the groups. Um, one of the approaches we take with consultancy is to ask about scenarios and to recreate those scenarios. And the actual threat actors out there, the ones you're worried about, the ones that we're interested in. So we say, what are you particularly concerned about? Is it journalists? So if you say, okay, well, scenario-based testing around journalists, which we've already discovered, we're going to be doing some social engineering. We're going to be making phone calls. We're going to be trying to get ourselves invited to things. We're going to be turning up at the right places. If it's um, corporate espionage, then we'll emulate that. And that really gives you uh, a, a visibility and optic into the level of threat that each of those groups present to you. So it's sort of worth thinking about when you're actually doing, thinking about your threat and thinking about your fences, is to lift down what are you actually concerned about and then use that to start your process. Definitely, I think that the key thing is to maintain privacy as well. What's the gain? You know, we're talking a little bit here about the uh, hacker side, but what's the gain by putting the appropriate measures in place and knowing what to look out for is uh, maintaining um, your own privacy on board, privacy of your data, your systems, um, because that, that's a big thing nowadays. We're losing that uh, knowledge of what, what privacy really is. And especially in business, if you're a yacht owner, crew, there, there's a certain amount of privacy that you want to keep, especially if, if you're a yacht owner. That's, that's the last bastion of um, privacy almost in, in the middle of the the ocean, beautiful location. Uh, let's let's maintain that privacy. Um, that for me, that's what's to gain for the ships, yacht owners, etc. Well, for, for all of us as individuals as well, businesses. So, um, key thing nowadays. Um, so that brings me on to how to identify attack. This really here is a list of all the different types of attack. Certainly not comprehensive, but different types of attacks that can uh, happen to to your yacht. How do you identify this? I mean, if you've got a key logger, it's going to be very difficult to to identify that. Um, Rootkits is. Mm. Uh, do, do we expect the ETO on board to know what a rootkit is? Probably not. Uh, the 
you know, the basic firewall on board does a certain amount, but uh, you know, there's there's so much here that needs to be taken into account. Yeah, it's, for sure. You know, it's, uh, it's a big job by identifying all these bits and pieces and knowing if you know all your systems are on board are completely safe or as safe as can be. Yeah, it's um, it, it's a fine balancing act. I mean, the, the one of the greatest offences in any network are the sysadmins uh, who understand the network. They learn what it does, what it feels like, how it behaves under certain situations, and they can spot anomalies. Because we can try and do that electronically. I mean, for any ETO with responsibility for the full network, um, that's a lot of information to uh, a lot of knowledge there to be able to spot viruses, to be able to spot anomalies. Yeah. I mean, really, as well. Sorry, Rick, I didn't catch that. So on top of the normal job he has to do, um, you know, his day job, this is uh, you know, it's so much stuff that he has to, he or she has to take on and, you know. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, it, uh, in the, we, we have a joke around um, how, how do you know you've got a hacker in your network? Because everything works. <laughs> Absolutely true. Okay, why, why is that? Uh, well, um, okay, let's say I uh, get on your yacht systems and I've, uh, I've exploited a, a vulnerability, something maybe Wi-Fi or something internet facing over your, uh, over your comms, uh, however I get on there, not important. Maybe I can smuggle a bit of device on and I plug that into the network, so I'm like a land turtle with a 4G connection. Uh, I'm going to patch all of your things, I'm going to close everything down because I've got access, I don't want anybody else getting access, it's mine, that's now my hacked network. You bury yourself into the network. Sorry? You bury yourself into the network, basically. Yeah, I'll create another way of getting in, uh, and then I'll make sure no other hackers can get at the prize that I've won. And so that's the running joke, is how you know you've got a hacker, because everything's working. Because um, in normal networks, not everything works. I mean, we run uh, quite extensive online training labs for, um, for pen testing, various things, and the amount of hours we put into just keeping them up. Uh, yeah. We actually didn't know what we're doing. You know, if they suddenly started working magically all on their own, I'd be very suspicious because that's not the norm. Um, for an ETO on board, you know, knowing all of this, it's there. It's getting external help, um, having that third-party supply chain. So things like um, security operating centres, good quality monitoring uh, around the network as well to give you alerts. However, there is a, a downside to that as well in our experience, whereas uh, I've seen plenty of places where they've got a new intrusion detection system in and they're very excited about it and it starts flashing up constantly. Uh, and they go, oh, there's an, alert, there's an alert, oh no, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. And eventually they just literally put a blanket over it and just ignore it because it makes too much noise. So there's also elements of conditioning uh, around people who have to run these things, which is why you know, considering a third party SOC who would actually uh, do that for you is advisable you know it's, it's definitely something to be looked at does that uh, does that have any implications with uh, privacy though if you're monitoring externally the the networks on board or can it be yeah. done anonymously that's right yeah i mean that that's those are the questions that you need to ask at any supplier not just a third party SOC, but anybody providing any kind of um or you're providing any kind of access to their network including equipment on the boat as well you simply yeah. don't know what um, you know that that smart TV is what data that's hoovering up and sending. Uh, so this is all part of supply chain management and having good policies in place and asking the right questions of suppliers. Um, yeah. Monitoring outgoing traffic. If you, uh, you know, most online streaming services or bits of software are very popular at the moment because everybody's uh, spending an awful lot more time at home. Uh, if you actually study the traffic, uh, analyze the traffic, the amount of places that they are reported, that they even, you know, run of the mill installable software for, for your average PC that lets you stream online. You might be reporting back to 30 or 40 different IPs or URLs, uh, local activity on your machine. And that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, if you don't have to look for it, um, you're just, you know, you're not going to spot it except in an increase in bandwidth. So having a really strong supply chain management and supply chain security policy and how you pick your suppliers is, uh, is absolutely crucial. Even that you need to be careful with, though, don't you? Because uh, even on the uh, um, manufacturing of equipment, say a laptop, I know I think it happened to Lenovo uh, a few years ago where um, chips with malicious code were being installed in the laptops on a production line in, in China, and they would then make it into the the, uh, the commercial market. So <laughs> it's um, 
yeah, it's a hell of a minefield out there trying to um, keep an eye on all these different bits and pieces. Yeah, yeah, it is very, very difficult. Um, if, if you are super paranoid about it, it does slow down the procurement process uh, an awful lot. But I say with the Lenovo laptops, they're not alone. Um, there, there are dozens and dozens of examples. Cisco routers, for example, also have a chip in them. Sure. The, uh, the manufacturers and suppliers will say, oh, that's for debugging, or that's for remote monitoring, or so we can assist you remotely. And they are probably all legitimate reasons for having that in there. Um, yeah. A lot of uh, instant messaging apps, um, which are very popular, have uh, developer stubs of code, uh -huh. which are remotely uh, enabled. So, and this is something the developers have often put in to make their life easier. So if they have a large deployment somewhere, they can get in, they can fix, update the code, make changes and fixes. But of course it presents a huge privacy issue. Now, that's going back to what we said earlier about, you've got to have usability uh, as well as security on the other hand. And there's a fine balance to me there. And what suits you is your threat appetite. Uh, and that's the term where you can work out, you know, how much risk are you prefer to, uh, prepared to accept. So it's simply not possible to eliminate all risk. So some will ultimately need to be accepted. Understood. Um, so what needs to be done in the, the, the coming months or just what needs to be done generally to um, put the appropriate measures in place to um, make sure you're secure as possible on board and give yourself peace of mind. Uh, there's a few things I've listed here. The, the white elephant in the room, I think, is the, the IMO resolutions that is, I think, coming out in 2021 or needs to, or applies from January 1st, 2021, and the ISM code there. This is gaining traction now. More people are making noise about it. This is going to include everything that we're talking about here, checking those systems on board, doing a further risk analysis, audit, penetration testing. Uh, incident response and includes many of the other points we've uh, touched on already and follow that, that actual top point there. So monitoring of the systems on board, regular audits and penetration testing, so stress testing, regular mm -hmm. stress testing, because there's so yeah. much coming out of the network. Um, any yeah. any tips or tricks for, for people out there uh, on this particular subject? Yeah, it's, uh, everybody's cybersecurity plan is going to be unique to them. Uh, and having one that's designed and works for you and followed through is absolutely essential. And it will include all of these things. If you don't have an incident response plan, get one. Even if it's generic and you find it online, practice it, tweak it to your own individual use. Incident response is not just about steps. Uh, you detect a breach or you suspect a breach. It's not just about which buttons you press. There are so yeah. many other elements to it as well. It can involve legal, can, you know, do you need to phone a legal team, PR, media, what do you need to do? All of that should be an incident response plan. And to this day, I have never once from the off seen a complete incident response plan. No one's, oh, yeah. It's, 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 huge, uh, it's, it's yeah. not easy to put together. There's, um, you, you're looking at the whole um, life cycle of the ship and all systems on board, anything that connects, including the yeah. human element. Absolutely. Um, and of course, the, the important thing about regular pen testing and stress testing is that's not just to keep people like me employed, that's because things change. And so fast we can you know, pen test uh, the ship, write the report with all its glorious details and give it to you, somebody comes and plugs someone else in. You add a Raspberry Pi to monitor the temperature in the engine room, or something like that, you've changed it. Yeah. You've now changed the threat surface. Uh, that's why it's, having it done regularly is required. And it's, I, be very, very unusual to find any systems of the complexity that we find in ships that aren't being updated, parts replaced, things added, things taken away, and that's why it's got to be done regularly. And as I say, it's a process, it's not a destination. Uh, and so having that cybersecurity plan uh, for management of your risk is absolutely crucial. And does the, um, the proliferation of IoT, that kind of increases the risk, right? Oh yeah, I IoT is so cheap. I'm just looking at my desk. I'll bet I've got something on the desk. But, yeah, this is one of the specialities, is it not, uh, Campbell, on the, yeah, the IoT front of So just under my laptop, I've got Raspberry Pis, I've got Pi Zeros, I've got um, 
you know, the, these things are so cheap. These devices. This is a programmable board. So I can literally program that to be any kind of device I want and solder it up the way I want it to be. Building IoT devices is incredibly cheap and incredibly quick to do. Uh, there are a lot of operating systems available for them. I've got off on the other side over there, I've got a whole bunch of other boards and things which I can install various operating systems on. It's cheap, it's prolific, it can solve very specific problems very, very quickly and quite so attractive. The downside of it is it's cheap. And it's prolific. So if you're buying off-the-shelf yeah. IoT devices, uh, there's generally no way of updating them or patching them. So say you buy uh, a bunch of temperature sensors or CCTV um, for your ship or whatever systems you're trying to protect. If a vulnerability is found in those operating systems and all the firmware or whatever's making those devices work, it can't be fixed. Mm -hmm. There's no real way of patching it. They're generally internet connectable but um, they don't have the mechanism. They've been stamped on a, in a factory, firmware stamped onto the chipset in a factory, done by the lowest bidder. And uh, oh. thus they, they're cheap and yeah, they, they present a huge risk. They're so quick to deploy uh, that they can change the shape of your network in minutes, just by people plugging different things in. But yeah, I, IoT is a huge risk, yeah. There's a great example, I think, of a casino in uh, Las Vegas, obviously the land of casinos where this casino, by most of the casinos there are really secure. You, you try and hack them or just even scan their networks, they'll hack you back. Uh, what let them down was uh, somebody found these big fish tanks that they have located around the, uh, the casino, new fish tank thermometer, IoT device, completely insecure. And uh, somebody was able to get onto that fish tank thermometer through the command line and then get into the rest of the casino systems and cost them millions, kind of wipe this, uh, this particular casino out. So even with all the uh, uh, safeguards in the world, uh, you're fighting back whatever it might be. Uh, you, you need to check everything that you're putting on that network because there's potentially always a way in, especially if the network's changing and you're adding different pieces or swapping swapping the equipment out you know so that's that, that for me that's a that's a great example you know yeah that was a classic <laughs> the uh, the aquarium fish tank was uh, it, it, i think actually that one pony award as well if anyone's interested if you, if you look up the pony awards they are an annual competition whereby the most ridiculous or humorous hack uh can win an award and uh, I'm pretty sure the aquarium one actually was. Sort of, <laughs> we don't know. Who, we don't know who the criminals were who gained access, but they were sort of like virtually given an award just like, well, like a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, 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 presumably or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a massive ecosystem here. One thing I've uh, not spoken about actually is uh, GPS and uh, the, the potential G, uh, spoofing of GPS signals, which uh, kind of adds to the whole equation here um yeah, you know, sure. you can those gps signals i guess in, in reality is not too easy to do you need to be quite close or have a device on board that's manipulating the uh the signals but uh, that kind of adds to the whole really? uh, issue. Well, as i showed this before so the two two hundred dollars and i can spoof gps with that how many two hundred bucks wow okay but, so, uh, you know, that, that, I guess you can get it on Amazon or, or Alibaba or whatever, yeah. whatever this is uh, available. Yeah, now the uh, for GPS spoofing, there is a Canadian company called ETA who make really high-end software-defined uh, radios. And oh. um, it's really good quality stuff. And they have a subsidiary company called Navsys. And uh, Navsys, uh, they, you can't just buy the software. It's very expensive. It's like $10,000. I used to have a copy of it, uh, but the license expired. At, I had to fight tooth and nail. I was doing work for the UK government, um, police yeah. force uh, specifically, who were interested in drone defence and uh, tampering with GPS and drones. And so only because I was doing work for them was I able to get a copy of this software. But the NAVSYS software is used for testing and emulating GPS uh, signals. So there are commercial grade stuff that's out there and with the right hardware, Anybody with you know without too much knowledge can just punch numbers in and, uh, and spoof GPS signals. Doing it um, yourself really a bit harder. The maths is kind of hard. <laughs> There's a lot of mathematics, but it is doable. Yeah, and it's been demonstrated that it's doable several times. 
I know it's, uh, I know it's a particular concern in certain parts of uh, the globe. I think and um, the the Horn of Africa, obviously, with piracy, and um, the north of Norway, um, up up there. Um, obviously, not too many yachts going in, in that direction, but certainly a problem for commercial and uh, adventure yachts. These explorer mm -hmm. yachts that are going further and further afield. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Um, let's have a look. Okay, um, so just going to look at a few questions here. If anyone's got any questions, please do uh, use the uh, the chat on your right hand side. I think there's a question mark you can click and uh, just ask some questions. Uh, I've got one question here. Um, So somebody here has worked for a company which hackers jumped onto a data network. They then jumped onto the voice network and ran up a bill of 70K using a premium uh, number based in Cuba. The Cisco kit had uh, default passwords and uh, were never changed. I mean, that, yeah. well, not so much a question, but uh, a great example of um, what can be done. So not so much damage done to the network or anything taken from, from on board, but just running up a bill of 70k on your your voice lines is uh, pretty immense yeah so it's quite a common scam actually um not often admitted to generally argued about uh, there was an example a few years back where uh, somebody had i would say a few years back i'm talking about 15 years back actually where someone had uh, in the old dial-up modems someone in the uk misconfigured their modem or uh, on their pc and they they automatically redialed the the ISP phone number sorry, you know, a thousand times a minute and ran up a bill of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Uh, and BT made them pay it because it was it was their their, um, their error. Uh, but well, yeah, yeah. the old phone. Yeah, top they have to pay it, don't they? Sorry, Rick, didn't catch that. They have to pay it surely at that at that point. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> This uh, is um, it actually has its own category, but VoIP networks are no different to any other network. It's um, transmission control protocol, network data. It's mm -hmm. just carrying different data. It's carrying uh, a codec of voice or video, depending on what it is. Sure. But yeah, the, the networks are no different. They use routers, switches, cables. It's all the same stuff. I know that was a particular problem back in the ISDN days um, when it was kind of... Uh, build per usage so have you seen any positive changes since your so-called newspaper demonstration uh or since your demonstration back in 2017 the unfortunate any positive changes how how is it changing on that respect i have one of the things i've really noticed is um there's been more of a focus in my industry to assist and address uh with maritime security and so we're seeing more companies and more individuals who are taking the time to gain the skills, gain familiarity with the, the CAN bus data that Exist Systems use, for example, and actually really sort of have some skills that, uh, that address the market. So if on my side of things, consultants are actually sitting up and taking notice and saying, actually, yeah, there is a problem here to be solved. That's positive. And that would only be happening if uh, the owners and the builders are also starting to hold up their hands and say, yeah, we have, a, we have an issue that we need to solve it. So supply and demand is indicating that, yeah, things are going to improve. Uh, in terms of general trends towards computing, um, we have seen you know, cloud computing has really come on in leaps and bounds recently. Um, security in even default Amazon uh, AWS instances or Azure instances, uh, by default, everything is actually really pretty secure. Uh, and even in local server uh, installations as well, using server 2019 for virtual machines, for example, out of the box, they're actually pretty good. Uh, so uh -huh. we are seeing, we're coming to a point now with technology where things from the traditional exploit route that we used to be taking to reverse engineer DLLs and, and find a way to exploit them, that's, that's, that's thin ground now. Um, for ex exploit and research development. But all this will do is push the attack techniques down a different road. Uh, rather than actually sending you, trying to get you to click a link in an Excel spreadsheet and download some software that's going to exploit a particular known bug on your laptop, you know, we're going to be using different routes of attack. So 
well, you know, one door shuts and no one opens uh, in cybersecurity. And that's why we will say it's a process. You know, we've got to be constantly vigilant. No matter how good we think you are, no matter how good the sales pitch is from the software vendor, uh, how good the firewall is and how many accreditations it's got, that, that process still needs to be undertaken. Uh, another question here is regarding uh, someone hacking a yacht and taking control of it. What steps should be taken? I think the first thing to ask would be how easy is it to actually take control of a yacht? In my opinion, it would be very difficult. You need a, um, a set number of things to happen before you can actually take control of a, a yacht. But yeah, what would be the first steps if you suspect somebody's hacked into your yacht and has, has control of uh, system navigation or console on board or one of the control systems um, that uh, actually helps with the running of the yacht? Yeah, for sure. Um, to take control of a yacht would require uh, theories of events. So yeah. access first and foremost, of course, then uh, any of the actual industrial controls will need to be on the same network and accessible. Uh, my experience is that that's actually more common than not, if I'm honest. Um, but things like you know, engine management, starting engines, um, you know, uh, one of the things we've been playing with recently is uh, open source chart plotters, which are getting quite popular now as well. There's a, a German outfit who are producing open source um, electronic chart information uh, so we've been reviewing the security on those as well there's, there's a number of things that would need to happen uh, for it to really be a reality is it beyond the realm of reality no it's not uh, yeah. it is possible is it going to be possible in every situation no percentage of situations where it's possible no idea <laughs> you know, we'd, have sure. to, uh, we'd have to assess every single yacht out there to be able to do that and that's just not possible but yeah, it's, it's not beyond uh, it's not beyond the realms of James Bond and uh, science fiction. It could be done. Cool. You touched there on the uh, the charts and uh, ECDIS. I guess that's uh, something you're referring to. A lot of yachts are going paperless and do not have the paper charts on board, even as a backup these days. Yeah. Uh, have you done anything on on that side of things with the, the ECDIS and electronic charts? How vulnerable is that on a yacht? Well, there are two uh, attack vectors and that we've uh, witnessed. One is just simple denial of service, which is to just make it stop working. That's actually pretty trivial to do, is to just knock out your ECDIS system. Um, and depending on the manufacturer, the software version, we, we are seeing a, a number of denial of service attacks, which are, which are feasible. And of course, without paper backups, um, yeah, it's going to be an uncomfortable situation for most people. Uh, in terms of actually uh, affecting them, the protocols in use when you're downloading updates, this is something that we're watching very carefully for future. Because depending on the make, model, age of system, updates might come on um, flash drives or it might even come on uh, older DVDs. Uh, we're moving to more and more manufacturers moving towards online updates, so you're downloading updates, and that's a particular attack vector. Whereas if we can, uh, if we have control of your communications, be that over your Wi-Fi or your VSAT, we can corrupt those charts. We might even be able to overwrite um, it by injecting into and replacing uh, items in the stream. If it's not being done properly and, secure and securely, then there is a potential there where we could give you false chart information. And that's something that we're, we're paying particular attention to at the moment. Uh, good security practices from the, uh, from the actual manufacturers so far have shown that you know, using TLS communication, this removes any possibility of fabrication or interference with the actual data stream. However, if, depending on how it's configured, if it's being downloaded, uh, decrypted, and then sent to the ECDIS system over clear text, then yeah, we can inject, we can update, and we can change it. So, a few things there that we need to be aware of. And of course, the, uh, the actual um, download sources for the charts themselves uh, need to be monitored. Verified, if you're down, yeah, yeah if, you if you're down, down, sorry, say that again, Rick. How do you verify the source, for example, that you're downloading yeah. from? Uh, nothing's been tampered with as it as it comes through. Um, just on that, uh, I've got a question here regarding the um, uh, test standards available for commercial bridge navigation and radio systems, uh, IEC 61162. And uh, the new IEC or forthcoming IEC 63154. Do they have a role in the uh, super yacht sector? And are there alternatives 
to these that would be more appropriate. I would suggest that they do. If, if they're applicable in the, the commercial sector, they're certainly going to be applicable in, in the yachting sector because uh, what you're looking at is a, is a ship effectively, different use case, but uh, the, the um, same regulations or standards are certainly going to be applicable. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there are, uh, there are oh, excuse me, there are uh, no sort of set standards for security um, that there are attempts at. Uh, and any standard is better than no standard. So if it can be applied or it can be modified um, to your uh, to your particular use case, then yes, it's a good starting point. Uh, obviously, global standards, the ISO standards, um, 27001 in particular, is really good for disaster recovery, incident response, but doesn't really tell you anything about security engineering. Uh, there are some movements out there. There's the MISRA standard, which is coming into effect, which uh, is for C-sharp coding, uh, I think, called Java or maybe both actually, I forget, uh, which actually aims to lay out engineering standards for software developers. And so it's mm -hmm. slow to come, but these standards are starting to emerge. There is a, an IoT standard. Uh, the EU released the IoT standard in uh, May this year, I think. It, but oh. it's voluntary, you know, it's, it's the guidelines. There's, there's no actual legislation. But if there are standards that fit and suit, by all means, you know, incorporate them and use them. Uh, if only from a, a, the optics of risk reduction, in the event of something going wrong, you've at least got the uh, the dialogue where you can say, we followed these standards as closely as we could. Yeah. And it's, it's demonstrating best efforts as well, because that can actually fend off quite a lot of legislation, a lot of uh, uh, liability. Understood. Um, got a question here regarding the, uh, the Wi-Fi. And why is it so easy for a hacker with or without the device you mentioned earlier? Um, don't need a device. I think you can do it with um, specialized software on a laptop. But yeah. how? Uh, why is it so easy to access your network if the password is protected? Do they correct right. the password itself or what is the weak link? I think they're looking for the, the handshake on the... That's right. the yeah. Uh, this is the only thing this yeah, if, it's really use. So if it's regular Wi-Fi, I just have a high gain, particular chipset on there. And you're absolutely right, Rick, it is about capturing the handshake. Um, so WEP, a wired equivalent privacy as it was known, uh, is horribly designed and incredibly vulnerable and was fairly rapidly replaced with WPA and WPA2. Now the way this works is that there's a, a four-way handshake that happens when your device logs on. And that is, I won't get into the technical details of it, but during that time, an encrypted version of the password is, is passed over. Now, however, if we can capture that handshake, and it doesn't matter whose it is, it's not individual, any one of those handshakes logging on to that base station, we've got everything we need to launch an attack. So once we've got the handshake on one hand, we have a very, very, very long list of possible passwords on the other. And while we're not decrypting it, what we're doing is brute forcing it. So we're tying a password, does it fit? No, try the next one. And we keep going until we get the password. So sure. those are part of security. It's always wise, if you're setting up uh, a, uh, a new Wi-Fi with a new password, is to get something like the Rock U dictionary, which is just a very, very large text file. Um, opening it on your laptop will cause it to slow down. It's gigabytes in size, but that's what we use as our password list. To brute force passwords. Uh, if you're thinking about using a password, go and see if it's in one of those dictionaries. If it's in one of those dictionaries, it's gonna it's gonna get compromised. It's as simple as that. You need to pick something very very unique. And the advice we're giving people now is rather than using uh, super complex passwords, which are hard for us to remember but very very easy for a computer to interpret, is to just use long passwords. So it doesn't matter if it's all lowercase, as long as it's 40, 50 characters in length. A uh, WPA password can be up to 72 characters. So it could just be a long phrase, it could be a, a verse from a song that you know. Uh, as long as it's easily, remember, um, easily memorable to yourself, easily communicated, it would be nigh on impossible to, uh, to crack a 42 character plus password. So if that was the case on the, the yacht where you um, uh, demonstrated this on in 20, 2016, then you probably wouldn't have got that Wi-Fi password so easily. Were they using the, the strongest encryption on the Wi-Fi in that case? Back yeah, they were using WP, uh, WPA2, um, uh, the, the, the CCTM standards is, is the strongest encryption available, so they yeah. made effort. 
it was a 12 character password and it was in one of our uh, in one of our password lists and I said, it took us 25 minutes to get the handshake and that's partly because of the distance and I was just using the laptop I wasn't using uh, anything high gain we sat in a car over there uh, it took 25 minutes to, to grab the handshake and it took less than three minutes to crack the password so not, not much processing power needed there to, to do that then I guess mm -hmm. hardly any yeah it's uh, so wi-fi hacking is not a specialism uh, anymore it, it's all largely automated sure so just gonna start wrapping up um got a question regarding the uh the training and what what training would you recommend for um a, a crew captain eto and even down to the the rest of the crew on board what basic training would you recommend to uh, get people up to speed with this stuff is there anything they can do yeah um Obviously, security awareness training is one element that's absolutely essential, and uh, I think most crew have this annually have a refresher. That's uh, very important. Uh, however, actually undertaking some training uh, to find out how do we actually hack? What are the methods that we use? Um, try to turn you into that kind of mindset of person, so you can look at your own things and go, okay, I understand how hackers operate now. Uh, what would I do to break into this? And having that cyclical process of being able to review your own threat surface and just having enough knowledge not to become a professional hacking consultant or a criminal if you're that way inclined but yeah. to understand the process of what our hackers actually doing how does social engineering work and what does it look like how does network penetration testing work what is what does the exploitation of a vulnerability look like how does it happen how do we find them and how do we do it having that kind of knowledge that step up from the security awareness uh, is very very useful it's, it's a real powerful tool it's definitely something people should consider, it, technical or not. Just having the uh, the optics, the visibility into uh, into how people like myself go about our trade. Sure. So, and, and final question, just to wrap things up, what would you recommend needs to be done to, you know, what are the first steps somebody can take if they've got a uh, a yacht, vessel, captain, owner? what can they do what are the first steps they can take to um securing their yacht okay yeah it's a big question um understand what's on your yacht i think would be the first and foremost thing uh mm -hmm. something very common in our industry is we'll go into a data center or a big corporate office and you get given a spreadsheet then this is all of our servers that's everything there and then we go poking around and we go hang on you've got twice as many as you think you do if you don't sure. know about you can't defend it and you can't be aware of it. So understanding every asset on your uh, on your ship and understanding what risk that presents, uh, what potential vulnerability and opportunity that presents would be step one. So full, full audit, maybe um, a risk analysis after that, some training and awareness, um, which is where where we can help out between uh, Pelian Consulting and Mary Metso. Um, so if anyone's interested, please please do get in touch. Um, Campbell, thank you very much for your time. Thank you everyone for joining in on this webinar. It will begin posted. So if you know anyone that's interested, please do pass it on. I will uh, always share the link and uh, reach out to people individually after this and answer any questions I didn't get around to uh, or we didn't get around to answering. Uh, Campbell, thank you very much. Have a great uh, weekend. Everyone stay safe out there and we'll, uh, we'll catch up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Campbell. Bye. Yeah.